Hey guys, uh, it's been, well, it's been over a week. I, I missed it last week, but it wasn't my fault. Uh, I meant to live stream last weekend, and the software just wouldn't work. I could not connect to YouTube, and so I couldn't go live, and instead of, you know, doing nothing, I just decided to do and basically ask me anything on Twitter, and, you know, went for three hours. So, unfortunately, here on YouTube, we missed it, but hopefully you were hanging out online that night, and uh, you were able to get your questions in, and... I took care of it. Um, let's see. It is currently is it Wednesday at 3 o'clock. Or Thursday at 3 o'clock. I have no idea what it is. It's Thursday at 3 o'clock. Um, I'm leaving for Arizona tomorrow. I won't actually arrive in Goodyear until Sunday evening. First games will be on Monday for me. My early games actually start today. Um, they played some inter-squad games the past couple of days on, uh, on the backfields. But uh, today is actually the first day that they'll be playing other teams. So, minor league spring training is pretty much full force at this point. I'll be there from Monday through Saturday. Hopefully, I'll get plenty of good information and coverage up. But, uh, yeah, so if you're looking for that, redsminorleagues.com, although I'm sure I'll have some videos here on YouTube as well. But uh, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get the full feel of everything if you, if you head to the website. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so for news this week, it uh, doesn't entirely relate to the minor leagues, but it does sort of. Uh, the Reds announced that they hired John Farrell to be a scout for them. Now, John Farrell is the former manager of both the Toronto Blue Jays and the Boston Red Sox. Led the Red Sox to a World Series victory in 2013. Uh, they let him go after last season. While he's going to be a scout for the Reds, his first assignment is to do internal scouting on the Reds organization, uh, on their farm system. Now, John Farrell's a former, pitch, uh, former pitching coach, so he's probably a little bit more comfortable dealing with uh, pitching scouting than hitting scouting, but you know he's a former big league player, former big league manager. He knows what to look for when he's looking for future major leaguers. He knows what those guys look like. Uh, I, think, I think this is a great move for the Reds. Um, you know, any, anytime you can get more eyes on guys like that, I, I think that it's good. Internal scouting is, is very key, uh, whether we like it or not. Unfortunately, some of these guys... They look good today, and in the future, they're, they're not going to turn out to be what we hoped. Uh, ideally, from an organizational standpoint, you could cash in on those guys' value before they start to show that they're not going to be that. That's kind of where the internal scouting thing comes into play. Um, hopefully, John Farrell can do good work, you know, checking out all of our guys, you know, and provide the right information to the organization and help the Reds make the right decisions you know, maybe, maybe come July, the trade deadline, you know, fingers crossed the Reds are playing well and they'll need to make moves to actually, you know, go for it, it you know, the, in the second half this year rather than trading away players and trying to improve for next year. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's a good move. I, I've seen some people speculate that, oh, the Reds just hired their next big league manager. Uh, I'm not putting anything into that. Uh, you know, the Reds have a former big league manager on their bench right now as a coach, Jim Riggleman. Uh, that hasn't really come into play as far as taking Brian's Pri Brian Price's job away from him. I think that the Reds are comfortable enough with Brian Price right now or they wouldn't have brought him back to begin with. I think this is just one of those situations where John Farrell was available. He was looking for a job, and the Reds decided to pounce on that. Um, now, I could be wrong. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out eventually, but uh, right now I, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that he's a former Major League manager and he's brought in to be a scout. But that, that's just my opinion. Let's see. Um, uh, the other big news of the week, uh, Minor League Baseball in partnership with Major League Baseball, they announced two new pace of play rules for Minor League Baseball in the 2018 season. Uh, one of them just kind of expands on a rule that's been in place for a while, and one expands on a rule that's only been in place in rookie ball. We'll start off with the pitch clock. A couple years ago, they implemented it in AA and AAA, 20-second pitch clock, um, they eventually expanded it to all of the minor leagues, tw basically 20 seconds before the pitcher makes his first move. Uh, otherwise, the batter is awarded a ball. <sighs> I didn't like it when they did it. I, there, there's been studies out there that suggest that the time between pitches, the shorter it is, the more it increases a pitcher's chance of being injured. I mean, we've already got enough injuries as it is that they're now basically telling guys, you know what, don't worry about that, that rest, that recovery between pitches. Not important. 
What's important is that we shave two minutes off of the game. Well, this year, they've made that a 15-second pitch clock when no one is on base, and it's going to remain at 20 seconds when someone is on base. Now, there are some loopholes in this. Uh, the clock stops the second that the guy makes his first move. So if you're in the windup, just when you start to make your first move, the clock goes off. Uh, when you're in the stretch, when you go to make that move to come set, the clock goes off. If you step off the mound, it resets the clock and starts immediately again, but that'll buy you an extra 15 or 20 seconds. Now, obviously, you can't just keep doing that over and over and over, but uh, it, it will buy you time every so often if you, if you do need it. Um, I, 15 seconds, is it, that's, that's not enough time. That's, that, that's too far in the wrong direction for me. I mean, there, there's just, there have been too many studies that show that it's going to increase the injury, or the likelihood of injury. And I, I just, I don't understand it. I, I don't know how Major League teams uh, decided that this was an okay option. So hopefully I can talk to the right people and ask questions about it. Um, that's going to be one of the things I'm hoping to do when I'm in Arizona, is try and find somebody to ask about this. Um, and maybe maybe we'll get an answer, maybe we won't. I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm going to do my best to ask as many uh people in development and scouts that are walking around, uh, you know, what, what their opinions are on it. Because I personally, I don't like it. I, I don't like the data that I've seen that suggests that it's going to increase injuries for pitchers. Um, there was a infographic going around Twitter the other day that showed the injury rate, or well, not the injury rate, the number of p- pitchers placed on the disabled list the two years after and the two years before um, they implemented the 20-second pitch clock. And there was, there was a clear uptick in players placed on the disabled list after they implemented the pitch clock. Now, maybe that's just random variance. I don't know. But when you put that along with the information that suggests that, you know, shorter recovery time between pitches does increase the likelihood of injury, it makes sense. So, I don't know. I'm not a fan of it, but nothing I can do about it now other than say publicly that I think it's a terrible idea. Um... Extra innings. When minor league games go to extra innings now, a runner is going to start on second base. Um, they're trying to cut down on all of the extra innings, whether that's because they don't want to run through pitchers, you know, in, in risk injury, which I don't buy because, well, we just talked about the last rule, so that doesn't make sense. Or they're just trying to keep the game going as fast as it can and get it over as quickly as possible. Um, that's probably what I would think is more accurate because if... They were worried about injuries or, you know, using too many pitchers. They just set it up so, hey, the game ends after 10 innings. Or, you know, whether it's, you know, win, lose, tie, whatever, it's over after 10 innings. It's minor league baseball. If the wins don't really matter and it's about development, then what does it matter if there's a tie? You know, you go out and you set those rules up before the season starts. Ticket buyers know what they're getting into. So, you know. Whether they really like it or not, they're agreeing to if it goes ten innings and nobody's beating somebody, you know that's what they agreed to when they bought the ticket. I don't know, but um, I I don't necessarily have a problem with that rule. It, it's weird, but I understand the concept behind it in terms of what they're trying to do. I don't really like that they're trying to do it that way, but at least I can understand why they're doing it. Um, if that pitcher or if that runner scores. It started on second base. It is not an earned run for the pitcher on the mound. Um, but I, I saw uh, Craig Calcaterra, if I butchered that name, my bad, but uh, he writes for NBC Sports. He, he tweeted out something after they announced the uh, the rule that, well, it looks like we're going to see every inning start with a sacrifice bunt uh, every every time and then maybe, maybe an intentional walk to set up a double play or something. But, um, yeah, if that happens, and I wouldn't be surprised if it did. I mean, how does that help baseball? All that does is make the fans in the crowd just sit there and shake their head. I, I understand that some people really like, you know, the sacrifice bunt and a well-executed bunt, but, you know, does that really do anything? I mean, all, all you're doing at that point is basically setting up, you know, these preconceived situations. And, I mean, you know, think about it. You know, if you're if you're batting in the top of the 10th inning, you got to run around second base, yeah, sack bunt them over and then... You know, they're going to counter, and they're going to try and set up double play to get out of the inning without giving up the run. Uh, it's just, it's a weird dynamic. It's, I don't know. You can think what you will. I, I don't know. I 
the more I talk about it, sitting here looking at the camera talking about it, the more I don't like it. But, again, it's one of those things, nothing I can do about it other than say that it's kind of stupid. Um, the third rule, which is new this year, but it, it kind of follows in line with what Major League Baseball is doing, is they're implementing the number of times that you can visit the mound. In AAA, it's going to be the same number as it is in the Major League. You get six. Six visits, that's it. And then you get one visit per extra inning that you play. Uh, in, in AA, you get eight. In high A, low A, advanced A, whatever you want to call it, you get ten. Now, I, I do like the fact that they're increasing it the lower you go um, because you know arms just aren't as developed, so you're going to use more arms in general. Um, but, again, it, it, it's still a weird situation. Uh, but then when you get to rookie ball, short season, complex leagues, uh, there is no limit, which I, I really do like because, one, I mean, some of these guys, they're out there, they're making starts, and they're only slated to throw three innings. So you're going to go through four or five, maybe six relievers in the game. So you, you need significantly more pitching um, mound visits, either between the catcher and the pitcher, the pitching coach and the pitcher, manager, pitcher, whatever, uh, than you're going to need in a lot of these other leagues because these guys are coming off of, well, I mean, I guess everybody was playing before that, but you know, guys coming out of high school, coming out of college, uh, they're not only adjusting to professional baseball, they're adjusting to pitching every five days or, if you're a reliever, pitching a few times a week instead of once or twice a week. So I, I do like that they, they have a lot more leeway in, in, the, in the lowest levels of, of the minor leagues there. But, uh, yeah, I think that that's it for this week. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm leaving for Arizona tomorrow. I'll be out there to start actually providing coverage on Monday. So RedsMinorLeagues.com will have everything you need there. I'm sure that I'll have some videos up on YouTube, but they'll also be on the website. I'm sure most of you guys know that I pretty much use YouTube as just a portal to host the videos on the website. But uh, yeah, so you'll 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 have access either way, either place you go. But you'll get a lot more <laughs> other than just the video if you go check out the website. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, maybe I'll try and go live at some point while I'm out there. It all depends uh, one on the, the internet connection I get at the hotel I'm at. That's with hotel information or uh, data. You you just don't know. Uh, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's really really bad. Um, but if I if I'm not able to do that, I'll probably try and set up you know a a question and answer kind of thing where I'll just sit down and I'll do one of these just live out at the fields in between games or something and and just try and answer some questions. So just pay attention for that. Probably uh probably have that one on Twitter. Um, just requesting the questions. So at DougDirt24, if for some reason you're not following me there. It should be right down here below my face on the screen, so you're probably well aware of that by this point. But, uh, yeah, until next time, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.